Hello and welcome to this Wealth Track podcast. I'm Consuelo Mack. Our topic today is finding treasures in problematic small cap stocks. Why would you want to do that? Because it's a strategy that has worked well for our guest. He is Bill Hench, who has a long track record of beating his peers and market benchmarks in the small cap value space. Hench is head of small cap strategy and portfolio manager at First Eagle Investments. He joined the firm in 2021, having run the same strategy at another firm for years. His flagship First Eagle Small Cap Opportunity Fund was recently called a great small value fund by Morningstar's mutual fund maven Russ Kinnell and earned their bronze medalist designation. Bill Hench, welcome to WealthTrack. It's great to be here today. Let's talk about the small cap universe. It, it, it's so intriguing. It is a couple of thousand companies, but you look for companies that are having problems. Why? We've, we've found that, you know, having been doing this for a very long time, that uh, your best opportunity to make money uh, are in those names that have temporary issues. And, and when you have a temporary issue and you're a small company and, and liquidity isn't great, uh, you tend to go down uh, more than you should many times. Uh, and, and clearly, uh, more than more than you'd see in big cap or or, uh, or mid cap, we think it's the best way for us to make the most money. You call them temporary unearners. That's an important distinction. How do you distinguish between the temporary unearners and the ones that are lasting unearners? So there's there's, there's lots of discussion um, uh, about small small caps and and some of the indexes having you know uh, close to thirty percent of the names. Where they've never earned money, or 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 perhaps you know have no clear vision to to, to becoming profitable, and uh, we we try to avoid those. And mainly, what we're looking at are, are names that you know are having a temporary issue where they might just for a short time not be making any money, or maybe just making not as much as as you'd normally would. So, uh, temporary issues versus uh, companies with no history at all of, of making money. And how do you find them at any given time? You've got a couple of hundred companies in your small cap portfolio. You meet with, what, 300 companies, management a year. I mean, how do you find the ones that are, are having these temporary problems? They're easy to spot because they're really, really cheap, right? Mm -hmm. The market reacts very quickly and, and is very impatient with, with companies that don't meet expectations um, or, or companies that, you know, through no fault of their own, are, are just going through a tough time because perhaps their industry is not not doing much, or or maybe their end markets are weak, or maybe they're in a commodity business that isn't doing well. We see a lot of managements uh, go to a fairly large amount of conferences, read a lot of trade publications, uh, listen to a lot of conference calls. There are uh, really uh, tremendous uh, opportunities to meet with most of these companies. Uh, they're interested in getting their stories out, and and quite frankly, as as the as the brokerage community has really pulled back on on research, uh, more and more of them are having to sort of go out on their own and and, and make sure that they they get an audience with, with potential buyers like ourselves. Right. So they're happy to see you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> um, it, let's talk about some of the differentiators that you got uh, with the the first eagle small cap strategy. And, and one of them, again, is the temporary unearners, overlook catalyst for improvement. But a, another one is that you tend to have um, more micro cap in the mix, uh, in the small cap mix as well. We don't really distinguish, or we don't look to, to say, let's buy a micro cap or a small cap. With us, we're, we're looking for sort of the best way to make money. Okay. Uh, but oftentimes, it, it is a name that are under a billion dollars. And and there are biases and people feel that investing under a billion dollars or some people feel that investing in things under a billion is too risky or, or they don't like the liquidity. And, and, and that's fine. And then there clearly are risks there. But we think uh, those risks are well worth it. Again, it, it does get back to those same issues about liquidity, history, um, and, and a comfort level in, 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 in being able to uh, sort of get information and... It's a great advantage if you are comfortable in that area because there are just uh, less people looking at it, less people willing to uh, to do the work. And, um, and and I think probably the biggest advantage is there's not a lot of patience, right? So if you are patient and, and, you're, and you understand that, that many of these situations are going to take you a year or two to, to get a significant return in, you could really be at an advantage. And, and I think 
that that were in that boat. You told me that if you take on more risk, uh, you should get paid for it. What is the performance objective in taking on more risk uh, in investing in these smaller companies, which, as you said, uh, tend not to be that liquid? You're exactly right. You, you should get. You have to get paid for this, right? Right. Because uh, otherwise, why bother? <laughs> right. There's lots of things you could do without worrying about liquidity or or, or uh, availability of, uh, of capital, right? And, and and the way we look at it is that over the cycle, you should get better returns than you would by investing in, in the S and P, uh, better than the the, the Russell indexes, uh, specifically the Russell value, and then and, and the and the Russell two thousand. And and if we do our job, you know, hopefully we'll do we'll do better than most of our competitors. And uh, you know, we I think we've had some some very good results over the years. And right, we do our best to 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 make sure that we mitigate the risk as as, as best we can, and and we do it with diversity and, and some other things as well. How do you mitigate the risk? And in, in looking at what Morningstar has written about your fund, which uh, has been very complimentary and. As I mentioned in my introduction to you, Russ Kennel, who is you know their fund maven, uh, it has named you one of the the three great small cap value funds, and and they, they do describe the fact that fund in your strategy is very volatile, that you tend to go down more in down markets, uh, you can knock the lights off in up markets, but uh, h- how do you mitigate that volatility, or can you in this universe? I think we'll probably will always be more volatile than well, clearly than the big and and, and mid cap. Even so, uh, you know, more volatile than than a lot of our competitors. But I would think that we're probably less risky than many of them. And and I say that because the the two things that we do and and two things I think that are very very effective and, and time has proven this is that if you keep your portfolio cheaper than the market, and, and by cheaper I mean just your basic. You know, valuation metrics like like price to book and price to sales. Uh, if you could do that and and be very diverse, uh, we think those are the best ways to to address risk. Uh, I don't say you can control risk, but I think you can address it. There are a large percent of people who think that you know you need to be concentrated to to really make a lot of money, and 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 we've, we've proven that you don't need to be concentrated. And in in this part of the market, we have found that. Spreading it out, not having uh, too much exposure to one name, really, really is is what best helps you uh, uh, mitigate the risk over time. One of the criticisms of a of a broadly diversified portfolio with a you know with a lot of names as you have, is that you know really you're kind of buying an index. Your active share, the differentiator between you and the index, is actually quite high. So h- how do you pull that off? We, we don't look at anything like the index and. And, and that's a result of, of really going after what we think are going to be the names that give us the best return, right? Uh, so we don't try to have X amount of banks or, or X amount of technology or healthcare. It's strictly where can we make the most money? And um, that traditionally, whether you're doing big cap, small cap, or any other uh, any other type of investing is, is going to probably lead you to something that looks very, very different uh, than the index, and and, and we also uh, you know are not uh, afraid or or we uh, actually very much like to go in, in things that are uh, sometimes smaller than than you'd find uh, in the indexes or perhaps um, uh, because of their history may not be in there either. Let's talk about some of the companies that exemplify your strategy, and you know with two hundred and fifty names in the portfolio, it it's it's a very eclectic mix. Needless to say. Um, and you were, you know, good enough to share a couple of uh, company names with me. So let's start with some of them. Uh, these are homes, a home construction company. This is sort of a, a a great time to be taking a look at at things where maybe the the current picture isn't so great, right? Do we know what's going to happen to housing three months from now, or six months from now, or even nine months from now? No idea, right? We have much higher rates with cancellations, right? For the first time, I think Beezer's cancellation rate was somewhere around 37% last quarter or 40%. But Beezer's a, a, a good example of, of you know what we like to sort of gather in times like this. Uh, you, you get a, a, a home builder that's pretty much uh, entry level and, and maybe that first move up buyer. Mm-hmm. Well, they control about 24,000 or so lots. It's a company with a history that, of really improving its balance sheet. Uh, over the last uh, five years, and um, you don't have to pay a lot for it, right? 
And the reason why you're not paying a lot for it is because people aren't willing to say, you know, I, I think the housing market is going to do this or it's going to do that. And throw in there talks of recession and everything else. And you get it, you get it at a price that if you're wrong, uh, you're not going to get killed, right? Uh, but if you're right, there's no reason why you, you, you wouldn't expect a double over time in this thing. And that's typical of what we try to do. And, and you know, not only do we own Biza, but we own five other names as well uh, in the building. And, you know, it's got all the little fundamental things that you like to see to, to make it sort of appealing when things start to work, right? He's in the right, they're in the right place, right? Lots of Texas, Nevada, Arizona, the Southeast, right? And, and, and this presents a great idea. And under normal circumstances, right, if, if we didn't have a parade of Fed officials on CNBC and Bloomberg every day, uh, you'd probably take a lot more interest in. And so we, we get it at the prices that we can now and we're willing to wait. And willing to wait um, because you make sure that basically none of your companies have greater than a 1% position in your portfolios. So how long are you willing to wait? We say most things work out between a year to two years. Mm -hmm. if, it, if it takes longer than that, you know, we, we jokingly say that's in the, the delayed turnaround phase, and we try to avoid those as, as, as often as we can. Um, but we generally stay with things for as long as the fundamental storyline stays intact. Nothing happens to, to make it worse than we thought it was going to be, and that the company is able to execute against against the plan. And, 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 you know, the best thing about these things is that, you know, the companies are very public and telling you this is what we think we're going to do. Uh, in other words, if they're not making money now, it's very common for a company to say, look, we're going to need two quarters before we can get to break even cash, and then maybe three quarters until we uh, uh, sub generate some nice cash flow, and, and then the four quarters will be gap positive. And you have a roadmap, if you will. As long as they stick with that, we, we, we stick with that usually. I, I mentioned, you know, you've got a very eclectic mix. So in, another company that you mentioned to me, again, that exemplifies your small cap value strategy is Modine. This is a sort of classic turnaround. Modine uh, makes, I guess, in, in mostly heat exchangers, or, or if you want to bring it up to, to date, you could call them climate solutions, right? Mm -hmm. But they make uh, heat transfer products for everything from from uh, commercial vehicles to, to data centers to refrigeration, HVAC systems, all those wonderful uh, industrial uh, applications. And uh, over the years, they had some businesses where they really weren't making great returns. They had uh, tried... Uh, successfully to sell some some businesses and unsuccessfully with some other, but they've really gotten themselves uh, back to where profitability uh, is getting more in line with with what you'd expect an industrial company like this to uh, to do. So uh, if you look quarter over quarter, things have gotten progressively better. And, and although the stock has has done very well recently, uh, it still has uh, a fair amount of go uh, to go to get what you what you'd consider uh, normal earnings this was a tremendous amount of work for them to, to get to this point but really what you were talking about with, with things that you see with many companies in many industries right product rationalization you know coming up with with better products with better margins maybe eliminating uh, some lines that that weren't going to get to the profitability that you needed so some would say blocking and tackling but i always think it's a little harder than that i don't think we give a lot of these uh uh, management's the credit for what they do. And and this is a, a very good example of, of a turnaround. Talk about a diff totally different industry. Uh, Steve Madden is another company uh, that you think exemplifies the kind of research and approach that you take, and, and that's a, a high fashion retailer. They have historically been a little too expensive for us to buy. One of the things we love to do is, is buy growth stocks when they're cheap, because then you could say you're buying something at a valuation that, that says it's value, but when things kick back into gear, you've got a company that has superior growth, and but you only paid a little bit for it, right? And and that's a great situation to be in. Steve Madden, I, I think they just broke through two billion in sales for the first time, and 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 for us to get a, a retailer and wholesaler uh, company with with growth uh, uh, prospects like this is, is terrific. The good news is you could buy it now cheaply because there's uh, lots of concerns with what the consumer uh, shape is going to be in, you know, in this coming year. Uh, you've got inventory corrections everywhere. You've got a lot of retailers not wanting to hold too much inventory, uh, and therefore you run into inefficiencies, right? And you run into disappointments. And I think that's where we are now. I don't think people, uh, and rightly so, 
uh, want to give credit for anybody who's in a business where there are just so many question marks. Right? But the nice thing about Madden is that they've proven time and time again, uh, historically, that they constantly are either you know at the forefront or right near the forefront of getting the right product out in a timely fashion. And with this, you get a little extra, right? So every name we have has a little bit of extra juice in it to make it uh, even more uh, 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 even more appealing. With Madden, you get not only are they you know is they direct the consumer working out well, but they've got a huge opportunity internationally, and and they've got a really sort of unknown to to most of the investment public, but not people who shop there. They they'll do about four hundred million in sort of non shoes okay. or bags and, and and apparel and such, and and those are sort of uh, you know, free little extras that you get that when things do straighten out and when people do feel better about the future, you're going to get a much higher multiple here. And so that's the appeal of sort of owning what, what many would, would think of more of as a growth stock uh, right. at, at, at a value price. If you, if you look back to recent history in a, in, a, in a strategy like this, that's what really sort of propelled earnings post-COVID, right? We were able to buy not just traditional value stocks that everybody thinks about, but but really growth stocks that had been uh, had pulled back so dramatically that they were trading at the same value as value stocks. And, and anytime you get that opportunity, and, and and you're usually rewarded a little bit quicker than you do with with traditional value names as well. What's changed in the small cap universe in the last twenty plus years that you've been investing in it? People are even more impatient mm -hmm. than ever, so uh, you, you tend to get incredible moves. We had an aerospace company that was up 40% one day only because they refinanced, right? Because everybody just said, you know, we're worried about refinancing. Can it get done? Can it get done? And, and so they sell the stock off over and over and over again. But the day that it happens, instantly it's up. Um, so I think there's more sort of shoot to kill and, and wait till you have proof in hand, which is tough to get proof in place at the same time, but right. everybody continues to try. There's less IPOs, which has affected our market dramatically, right? So there are less companies. There's less research coverage. But the nice thing is, is there's, there's really a tremendous opportunity to see as many companies as you like. So the companies have made a terrific effort to be available. Uh, some of that has to do with the fact that you can do everything online now. They, they're aware that, you know, without a lot of research coverage, that they've, they've got to spend some time with investors. And, and for people like us, that, that's terrific. How concerned are you about the fact that fewer companies are going public and, you know, more companies are, are also choosing to go private who, that have been public? It is a concern. And, and personally, I think it's just the cycle, right? It, okay. it paid to stay private. It stayed to not uh, come public until you were a mid cap or a big cap, right? Money was free. So it wasn't a concern. There was plenty of capital available, as there always is when it doesn't cost you anything. Uh, but now that we have interest rates, I, I, I think. Maybe you'll see a change to that. We are speaking with First Eagle's noted small cap value manager, Bill Hench. Bill, what role should investors expect small cap to play in a portfolio? I think traditionally it, you could get better returns, I think, over time with, with smaller names. So it's been a complementary product to an entire portfolio. So it's typical you'll see anywhere from 5 to 20% of, of a portfolio in, in small names. You know, that it, it tends to be more domestic. So the vast majority of, of the revenue in, in most of the, the Russell 2000 type names are, are domestic. And, and that's, that's how I've seen it used. I'm sure you get asked this all the time. Why small cap value now? Well, we like it all the time. It is one of the, the few parts of the market that's actually done really well during inflationary times. Uh, and, and there's no magic to that. It's just that you oftentimes smaller names aren't subject to the multiple expansion and compression that the big companies, the S&P type names are. Uh, in, in our world, things go up when they make more money and they go down when they make less, right? It's pretty standard. So when you do get inflation, by definition, your, your revenues from your goods or services or whatever you're doing are going up. You, you, you may be have exposure to, to some margin compression, but, but generally those, those gross margin dollars, the amount of dollars are going to be greater. And, and that's, that's what drives your market cap. They've done well historically in the uh, in the past during inflationary times. So if you're looking for something to sort of <laughs> hang the argument on right now, that, that's probably that's probably a good argument. And, and also, especially on the value side, coming off a year where, where things were pretty miserable, right? The, the small value index was only down about 14 and a half. I, I think the regular Russell was probably down somewhere near 20. 
but buried in there with, with lots of really, really uh, uh, good opportunities that were down 20, 30, even 40, 50 percent last year. And it's rare that you're going you're to get two really disappointing years like that in a row. Uh, so you're starting out at a very, very low base, low valuation. And, and that's what makes it appeal. Part of your strategy is that you keep the portfolio cheaper than the market, uh, than the Russell 2000 or the Russell 2000 value, 90% of the time. So where is it now, and, and how do you keep the portfolio cheaper than the market? By selling the things that, that are working, right? As these names get to what we think is a normal valuation, we are reducing them, right? Taking our profits. And, and with that money, we're buying things that are significantly cheaper <laughs> than the market, right? As we add names... Typically, those names are at a very, very big discount to, to what the market would be. And, and so it's the, the process itself which, which leads us to, to remain cheap. Everything has a termination. There's a termination for everything in the, in the portfolio. How much does it hurt to sell your winners? It, it's not the easiest thing in the world because they, they do make you feel successful and smart. And one of the nice things that the strategy does is it forces you to to uh, acknowledge those those winners by uh, by limiting the amount we'll hold of anything. So generally, when uh, when when a name approaches about one percent of the portfolio, we're going to slowly take some off the top. We're not going to sell the whole thing, but uh, you, you could bet that you know most days those positions that have done really really well, regardless of fundamentals, even if it seems like the greatest thing in the world, we're going to cut back because we have found that that's the best way to to reduce it. You know, you've, you've got to find somebody to sell this to, right? Right. And um, uh, unfortunately, not everybody's willing to take your entire position at the top. So uh, you've got to be very conscious of making sure that you take your profits. And are you able to always find you know cheaper alternatives that are attractive? There's always a part of the market in the best of times that, that isn't doing so well. There are always companies that, that are subject to events uh, unplanned, but, but maybe make things not so great in the short term. Uh, so even in the best markets, there's things to buy. And even in the Worst markets, there are things that are expensive that, that, that you could sell and, and use to buy, to buy those cheap names. We always ask at the end of every wealth track interview, if there's one investment that we should all own in a long-term diversified portfolio, what would it be from your perspective, of course, of running a very uh, broadly diversified portfolio in the small cap space? So what would your answer be? I, I think having a, a portion of your, of your uh, assets in small cap would be great, whether that's value, growth, or or traditional core, I, I think they'd all serve a really good purpose. And, and that is to, you know, number one, have exposure to, to a great part of the market where there's lots of growth, where there's lots of talent, uh, and, and where you, you know, you could still get a 10-bagger, right? Uh, and, and also it is a, a, a very, very good domestic play. Uh, as, as we mentioned before, you know, north of 80% of the revenues in, in the Ruffle indexes, I think, are, uh, are, are domestically sourced. Uh, and, and you get a, a, a really good mix of just about every part of the economy in there. And, and usually, many times, in the bad markets, you can get them at very, very good prices. And, and over time, that should help you with, you, with your long-term goals for, for getting returns that, that you're going to need. Bill Hench, thank you so much for joining us for this Wealth Track podcast. We really appreciate talking to you and hearing your, uh, your perspective. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. And thank you, our listeners, for spending time with us. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. In the meantime, make the week ahead a healthy, profitable, and productive one. 